Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's BU Alumni Career Weeks webinar, Five Steps to Make Work, Not Work. My name is Jeff Murphy. I'm a member of the Career Programs team here in the Office of Alumni Relations. Today's webinar is sponsored by BU Alumni Relations and is offered to our 326,000 alumni around the globe. Throughout your career, BU is committed to helping you define and achieve your professional goals. We aim to do this by providing alumni with access to a series of valuable online tools and social media communities. It's important that we get your opinion on how we're doing. So we very much look forward to uh, receiving your feedback from an Alumni Career Weeks survey that's gonna be emailed out to you next week. So please keep an eye out for that. I know that we have alumni joining us from around the world, nine different countries in places like Canada, China, Stirling Shire in the UK, uh, India, Italy, Kazakhstan, Thailand, two places in California that sound absolutely wonderful today, Sunland and Lemon Grove. Uh, California, Port Ritchie, Florida, Atlanta, Grays Lake, Illinois, Baton Rouge, New York City, Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, Charlottesville, Virginia, Cody, Wyoming, and as always, dozens of Massachusetts alumni from towns like New Bedford, Ashfield, Revere, South Walpole, Quincy, Methuen, and more. For each and every one of you out there, please know that we really do value your opinion on this and every program that we offer. Before I introduce today's speaker, some brief housekeeping notes. As you know by now, this webinar is being hosted on our brand new Zoom online meeting platform. If you experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of today's presentation, I'll ask that you please contact Zoom support directly. If you wanna jot uh, jot this number down, you can reach Zoom support at 1-888-799-9666. That's 1-888-799-9666. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be made available for on-demand viewing on the BU Alumni Association website found at www.bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is very eager to answer any questions you may have. You're welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A function. Uh, If you hover over the top or the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little selection for Q&A. Just hit that and type your question in at any point. Mark actually has a a bunch of material to go through. He's really going to be setting the stage before he gets into his five steps. And one thing he'd like to invite all of you to do is also to utilize the chat function. If you'd like to comment on anything that he's said, uh, feel free to also use chat to uh, weigh in with some of your thoughts or even ask questions. And I'll be keeping an eye on that while Mark's doing his presentation. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day, BU uh, College of General Studies and College of Communication alumnus, Mark Mayette. Mark is a strengths and possibilities coach. He's the founding principal of ECC Incorporated. He's an author, a talent development coach with Lee Hecht Harrison. Uh, He and his team create trusted advocacy-based relationships where clients achieve optimum performance based on talents and strengths. He works with teams to assess their teams based on their talents and strengths perspective. Uh, He spent 24 plus years with Fortune 500 companies uh, working in talent development. Uh, Today, he donates 25% of his time to provide pro bono coaching and support to those in career transition and nonprofits. He has his BA from Boston University, an MBA from Emory University in Atlanta, Uh, He's a certified professional in learning and performance, or a CPLP, from the Association of Talent Development, and a Gallup and Total SDI certified strengths finder coach. While attending BU, Mark uh, rode four years on the men's crew team, served as president of the College of General Studies Student Government, a VP in BU Student Union, and as a resident assistant at Warren Towers. I'm sure many of you have fond Warren Towers memories. Uh, Before he graduated, he was also awarded the prestigious Scarlet Key Award. Um, Mark has presented uh, several other excellent webinars for us, and I again invite you to to view them after this one in our on-demand library found on our website. Uh, Mark, thanks so much for being here today. Uh, Thanks for being back. It's always a pleasure to have you do a a presentation like this. I'm going to go ahead and uh, let you get your slide deck up and running, and then the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Jeff. And Jeff, can you hear me well? Sounds loud and clear. Great, and and thank you all, and thank you, Jeff, and Boston University for having me on today's presentation. As Jeff indicated, I spent four years on the river of the River Charles, and and, uh, so this presentation will be the last 500 meters of a 2,000-meter piece. And for those that are aware of rowing and, and, uh, and, and know about it, that's where we really, that's where we do our sprint. So we're going to be sprinting through some, some uh, key concepts. But as Jeff indicated, the, uh, for this presentation, 
you know, so I believe and I'm a firm believer that if you lean in on what your core wiring is and what your strengths are, then your world becomes uh, uh, that much better. My five, the top uh, 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 wiring aspects or how I see my world is about connectedness. I'm also a very creative in how I view my world, very strong beliefs. I'm also empathetic and I'm also strategic. And put that all together and, and couple that with my absolute love of uh, Boston University. Here I am at the dock of the BU Boathouse, standing with Rhett. Um, um, the other aspect about me because of my wiring is I see dead people. And I don't mean dead people from the standpoint of literally dead, but figuratively dead. And there's probably no accident and it's probably not a surprise to hear that a lot of people are showing up to work disengaged and a lot of people are showing up as retired folks or as military folks refer to it as roadies or roads retired on active duty. So I want to spend some time building some context and then we'll get into the top five. And again, as Jeff said, if you can go and type uh, comments in chat or if you've got questions, do that in Q&A as well. But uh, just for additional context, as he indicated, I work with students, those in career transition, those considering do, even doing a business, teams, managers of teams, as well as leadership teams. So what we're gonna cover today is besides identifying who's here, we're not literally gonna go do a, a side by side or in a one on one intro, but I wanna I get an idea who's here. I wanna spend time giving you a snapshot about the state of the American workforce. I do understand we have people uh, that might be accessing this from overseas, you probably have similar numbers. The reality is to be aware in your current state, the fact that you're listening to this tells me that perhaps you probably have some needs or desires or some wants or itches that need to be scratched. We'll talk about strengths-based career management as well as how do you figure this all out? And more importantly, what's the call to action? What are the five steps? So that's our plan. You'll see in this scattered diagram that these little dots indicate the people that have signed on to this webcast. And you will see, this is a well-scattered uh, uh, demographic. We have people that are logged in um, or that have signed up that are from the, the 70s. And then we have folks that are logged in that are fairly recent grads. So we have a fairly uh, evenly distributed distribution. This I would normally do in a, in a live session, but I want you to emotionally stand up for this, is that if I'm gonna rattle off some different attributes, if you talk to people in elevators or ele in airplanes, grocery stores, basically talk to anybody uh, uh, wherever you might be, that, that's part of your wiring. Also, you might have a closet organized by color or by another process. By the way, keep track of how many uh, resonate with you. Um, that, that might, uh, that's an indicator. If you write things, if you love to do to-do lists each day, including on the weekends, and then when you do something that wasn't on the list and you add the items and that you completed that weren't on the list, then make a note of that as well. You go directly to a familiar face when you go to a party. That's, that's an attribute for some folks and how they're wired as well. Another example is if you drive, if you're, if you're uh, from the New England area as I am, we're fairly known to be fairly aggressive as evidenced by my recent uh, speeding ticket that I'm negotiating with the state of Georgia. I need to compete with other drivers, anyone else? Um, and also some of you are wired in a way that if you're presented something, you like to ask lots of questions. In some cases, you'll ask many questions to the delight and sometimes the dismay of others around you. So with that being said, you might go to a movie and you might already know the plot. You might discover the plot before others. That also is a gift or an indicator. And then last before we go on is you might press a button or the button might already be pressed for the elevator ride, but you decide to press it again just to make sure that you can remind the elevator that you're there. If you keep track of all those, if you did keep track of all those, just in chat, um, how many of those resonated with you? Three, four, one, two, et cetera. And then, and then Jeff will report when I stop, uh, when I take a breath. So, so let's go through the, uh, the first part of the presentation, which is gonna be the state of the American workforce. And this is through a detail report that was done through Gallup. And basically at the core is 33% um, of employees are uh, engaged versus at best organizations the, uh, that Gallup tracks and works with where they have engagement of 70%. So Gallup in their key findings, they discovered that the workplace is changing, no surprise. Employee expectations are changing again, no surprise. 
There's a call to action to leadership, which is what we'll be spending some time talking about to, to act as context. And then reinforce the elements that drive, uh, uh, you know, they, they talked about what drives engagement. So from a generational standpoint, here's where we currently are. Uh, if you look at this diagram, Generation X, which is a light green, uh, represents 44% of the, uh, the workforce. Millennials are generating, again, about 44%. The traditionalists, and those are folks pre-boomers, um, are representing 4%. And, and, uh, and then, I'm sorry, the millennial, the baby boomers are representing 44%, and the millennials are representing about 8%. So they're rising up um, through the ranks. Hey, Mark. Yes. Sorry, I want to let you know, people really resonated with the stand-up piece that you asked. Uh, Sarah had four of them, Rachel two, uh, seven from one person, Taylor at least six, Jackie six, Bob three, uh, Lori six, Danielle most, uh, and a couple <laughs> other comments. So definitely people are, are uh, resonating with what you're saying. And each one of those, and thank you, Jeff, and thank you all for, the, for responding. Each one of those are an indicator about how you see your world. And, and when I engage uh, teams or individuals, we actually dissect that a little bit more, but that's an indicator. So if you're responding to that, then that tells us, and it'll, it should tell you if you really are serious about this, you filter your world in a certain way. And if you can embrace it and go forward, you'll be very productive. The other thing about the uh, Gallup report, back to that, thanks, Jeff, is the millennials are more likely than gener generation Xers and baby boomers to say a job that accelerates their profession or career development is very important to them. To the point where it's 45% of those folks that, that respond to that, the millennials, um, respond that way versus 31% or versus 18% for the baby boomers. 19% said in 2012 that it was a good time to find a quality job. And if you recall, 2012, the economy is fairly dicey. We were still in that slow um, recovery mode. Um, now, fast forward to uh, the end of the 2016, 42% said the same thing during the first uh, uh, three quarters of 2016. Now, 51% now today indicate that they are actively looking for a new job or watching for new job openings. So if you're an employer or you're an employee or you're on this webcast wondering, how can I make work not work? And you might be looking um, um, and you're trying to scratch this itch then be aware that you're part of the majority. Now, when people are, are trying to uh, recruit or find different uh, levels of employment, guess let's look at the top of the site, is towards the site. It's really, if you think about it, the best way to enter a job or is through networking. That's what I advise people, especially as they get catch up to me in age, is that the older you get, networking, networking, networking will get your next position. And this and some of these data points in the slide will also support that in addition to um, some of the more traditional uh, job seeking platforms. But what do people want today in the, well, in the past, they wanted a paycheck, they wanted personal satisfaction, they wanted quote a boss, um, they were part of an annual review. They, they were also uh, reminded frequently about their areas of improvement and it was a job based role that they were in. Fast forward to today, the future focus and looking ahead the, 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 where, where, how people, uh, what people want, they want purpose. They want development. They don't want a boss. They want someone that's going to help them, nurture them and coach them on to their next, next phase. They want ongoing conversations. Don't wait for the quarter. Don't wait for semi-annuals. Don't, don't wait for annuals, but have it on an ongoing basis. They prefer to be, to focus on their strengths. And instead of a job, they want to see how does this job uh, in, incorporate or integrate with my life. And that's the future focus. The left side of this screen indicates those uh, folks that are quote, currently engaged at work. And if you look at the bottom of the chart from 2000 and go all the way up to 2016, you'll notice there's not a lot of delta uh, uh, between where uh, the engagement levels, which speaks to the challenge and opportunities we have, not only as employers, but as workers, how can I get more engaged? The gray part indicates that it's not engaged. And then the dark gray or towards the black, it's actively disengaged. So which brings up the, the question, what is engagement? I, I like to define engagement by this ball of paper. Um, we see balls of paper sometimes lying on the floor. It's, I call it corporate litter. 
So you'll see a piece of paper on the ground. People that are engaged in the workforce or engaged in their job are more likely to pick up that piece of paper and just throw it away. If you're disengaged, you'll walk down a hallway, you'll see a piece of paper on the ground, and guess what? You'll walk past it because you know why? You didn't throw that piece of paper. It's not your piece of paper, so why should you bother? So the disengaged employees don't bother to do anything outside of their own scope. The actively disengaged, those folks that wish harm on the company that they work for, guess what? They're the ones that actually threw the paper. <laughs> so you gotta ask yourself, am I engaged, am I disengaged, or am I actively disengaged? If, uh, ideally, if you're engaged, then great, you're picking up a lot of litter. So the, the, the question many times people ask, and, and hope you might be asking this today, is like, all right, well, all right, Mayette, all right, smart guy, what's the, what's the speeding bullet? What is the silver bullet for us in this, uh, that if we're not engaged in the workforce? What can we do? The principle is focusing on what's right and not fixing what's wrong. If you focus on, on what's right, you will achieve exponential results. Let's get into a little bit more de detail and some examples and some specific data points from Gallup. Those who focus on using their strengths are three times as likely to report having an excellent quality of life. In addition, they're six times as likely to be engaged in their jobs. Again, those who focus on using their strengths. Those who learn to use their strengths every day have a 7.8% greater productivity rate. Teams who focus on strengths every day have a 12.5% greater productivity rate. Teams who receive strength-based feedback are 8.9% experience 8.9% greater productivity. Employees who receive strength strengths uh, feedback have 14.9% lower turnover. If you're in sales, you know somebody in sales, and they've got a manager who received coaching based on their strengths, experience 11% higher volume per customer and 16% higher closing percentage on average. So this isn't just like lofty stuff. These are data points and, and what better coming from a, a research organization like Gallup. So managers who ignore their employees' strengths, look at this data. Managers who ignore their employees' strengths don't even really focus on the strengths. Um, look, at, look at how this, uh, how this goes. 2%, two out of 100, say, uh, come out and say they're engaged. Uh, 57 out of 100 say that, you know what, um, I'm not engaged. They're the ones that are walking past the, that, that paper. And, and here's the startling one. Those are ignored, or employee strengths that are ignored by managers, are, uh, look at that, 40 out of 100 are throwing the paper. Now let's, let's kind of go upward. Managers who focus on employees' weaknesses or negative characteristics, and we talked about it, if you focus too much on what's wrong as opposed to what's right, this is still marketably better than those that, that, that don't have any conversations of, of uh, professional development. So you get 45% that are actually engaged. You get 33 out of 100 that are not engaged. And guess what? The number is almost halved in regard to actively disengaged as evidenced by the fact that the ball of litter is, is that much smaller. But here's the, here's the amazing thing. Managers who predominantly focus on employees' strengths reduce active disengagement to an astonishing low 1%. And then you look at 61% for engaged, and you look at 38% are engaged. So 1%, one out of 100 are actively disengaged, which is why I replaced that, that litter with a, a picture of Disney. And the reason why I do that is if you've ever been to Disneyland, which a majority of our uh, population does and has, you'll notice there's absolutely no litter in their theme parks. And if there is, it lasts only but a fraction of a second. So needless to say, development approaches to personal development, the conventional approaches, you know, let's, let's focus on an area of improvement, let's have a development plan and, and do that. The strength-based approach is let's focus on what your gifts are, let's focus on what you're good at, and then manage around your weaknesses. Let's, let's how to figure out how to modulate you know, what's going great and how to compensate for that and really focus on that because our team and you will be better served by doing that. Now, which brings us to the, the, the other part of the conversation is passion. 
Um, I can't tell you how many folks I've, I've sat down with and asked them what type of career advice they received, especially those that are in career transition. And they'll sometimes say, it's like people will share with them. It's like, you know, they'll be asked by a friend, a loved one that are meaning all the best intention. It's like, what are you passionate about? Well, focus on that and do a business on that or do something around there. And, and, I, and I say, well, I, that's part of it. Passion isn't everything, um, but passion is an important thing, but passion isn't everything. I say it's gifts, strengths, and passion. Combine those two, you will achieve exponential results. So let me give you uh, some more data on this. Strengths and uh, strengths-based uh, uh, approach is a strength equals to a talent. In this case, you might identify what your talents are through an assessment tool like Clifton Strengths Finder. Clifton's two, uh, Strengths 2.0 is an example. You might use another diagnostic. Now, and then combine that with um, your passion. In this case, it's uh, Gladwell did all sorts of research on about the 10,000 hour and, and mastery approach. And even that, I've, I wrote a blog on that because that isn't necessarily true, um, what Gladwell said. But anyway, but his premise is if you focus a lot of hours on something, chances are you will master it. Um, and, and so if you add the definition of what strength is, strength is the ability to consistently produce a positive outcome through near perfect per, uh, performance in a specific task. All cool, right? So let's, let's, set, let's bring up a couple examples. Um, we don't have football at Boston University. At least when I was there, we did. Um, and then they, they uh, stopped it uh, uh, after I left. But there's this fellow whose name, his name is Daniel Eugene Rudiger, also known as Rudy. If you ever saw the movie Rudy, this gentleman played for Notre Dame. Then we have Tim Tebow. Uh, Tim Tebow played for three professional teams. Um, in the Southeast here, we refer to SEC as the Southeast Conference. Up North, people refer to the SEC as the Southeast or the Securities Exchange Commission. <laughs> College football is really big down in the South, but he was a Heisman Trophy winner, Tim Tebow. And then there's a third fellow that um, played also for Notre Dame. His name was Joe Montana. And Joe Montana went on to become one of the best quarterbacks ever in the professional ranks. But at Notre Dame, he was also a record-setting record quarterback. When I do workshops with individuals, and you can apply this to this, to this slide uh, to reinforce that you need more than just passion to be successful or to achieve exponential results, we go through this exercise, and I'll have you go through this exercise where let's give everybody on this, on this page, Rudy, Tebow, and Montana, a five for passion. So in a one to five scale with five being totally high, they would all get a five for passion. Now, when we talk about their gifts and their talents that they had playing um, football, um, keep in mind that Rudy played two plays his entire football career at Notre Dame. He spent uh, six years trying to make it to the Notre Dame football team. And then um, eventually when he was able to uh, be a, a, a player on the team, he was part of the practice squad. And he eventually played two plays his entire career, but it became an inspiration. Um, uh, Tim Tebow became a Heisman Trophy winner, but as evidenced by the previous slide with Tim, he spent four, uh, three went uh, with three teams in the NFL, and and he he re, he basically achieved a Peters principle, where he achieved his he got to his level of incompetence at the professional ranks, and now he's playing baseball in the Mets farm system. So so and then Joe Montana won numerous Super Bowls, and, and I know for the Tim Brady, uh, Tom Brady fans, um, there's a big debate going on who's the best quarterback ever, but people would argue Joe Montana's as well. So if you apply this, this theory or this, this uh, uh, theorem, gifts times passion equals strength, and you, and you rated it a one to five on each, chances are Joe Montana would get the highest rating because of what he was able to do on the field, both at the college level and the professional level. Tim Tebow was, would be less, and then Rudy would be less than all three. All to the, to the point is if you focus on your talents and your gifts and apply your passion towards that, you will achieve exponential results. Now, let's get away from the sports analogies. Um, there was another study that was done to the University of Nebraska that was actually identified and, and applied this theorem to, um, uh, to reading. And they did, uh, they were testing, um, 
uh, average readers and then above average readers. In a test, they determined that in a minute, the average reader read 90 words a minute. And then the above average reader read 350 words a minute. They taught each of them how to uh, speed read. And then you would think which group uh, achieved better results through, the, uh, through this training. And it's counterintuitive. I'm going to bring this up, is that the average reader achieved almost, you know, uh, almost double, um, but short of double, 150 words a minute. And here's where, it go, here's where it's like totally off the charts. Those that read 350 words a minute and were taught how to speed read, look at their results, exponential. They went from 350 words a minute because it was already a strength. They, they were taught some additional skills, they applied it, and they achieved exponential results, 2,900 words a minute. So, it all, so what does this all mean? Basically, if you lean in on your strengths, apply your passion towards it, you'll achieve exponential results. All right, here's another reality piece. Some of you might be on this call and you might be feeling this um, but and wondering why am I feeling this way. Um, here's the reality. The reality is that we um, go to Boston University or we have options to to uh, be employed or be in an occupation in any number of 1166 jobs that are tracked by the federal government. There are 1166 jobs that we can uh, apply our gifts and, and uh, passions towards. You will spend 80,000 hours in a career. If you do the basic math, that's, uh, that 80,000 hours equates to 20,000 hours per 10 year uh, uh, block out of time. Now, granted, some people will argue, hey, Mayette, you know, I work 80 hours a week. God bless you. You're working 160,000 hours. But hey, you know, it's all 80,000 hours, 20,000 20, hours per 10 year, uh, 10 year increment. 70%, as we learned, are disengaged in the workforce. And we also heard that 16%, or we learned that 16% are literally throwing paper in the hallway. They're, they're actively disengaged. They wish harm in the company they work for. So that's a, a reality. So if you're any one of those and you're wondering why me or why am I feeling this way, you're not alone. So that's why I come back to a tweet I did uh, a couple years ago, which was being authentic versus going through the motions. Only one is sustainable. So if you're authentic to yourself and you, and you are uh, uh, sensitive to what, what your gut's telling you, what your gifts are and how do you lean in on them, then if you follow your path of truth, you will achieve exponential re uh, results. If you follow a path that's riddled in, in uh, deceivement or you're fooling yourself or you're just living a lie, it's not sustainable. That's why today a number of people, our compasses, our internal compasses are broken. And, and, and as evidenced by some of the really startling stats, statistics, which I'm not going to get into, but at a high level, we have epidemic levels of depression happening currently. We have epidemic levels of addiction currently. And unfortunately, we also have epidemic levels of suicide that are happening. Um, so if things are that great, then why are things so, in this case, you know, really startling? So these are all realities that we're all facing. I like to incorporate this gentleman, uh, Mark Twain, um, on my slides because Mark Twain once said the two most important days in your life is the first day, the day you were born, and then the second day, the day that you discover the reason why. So at the end of the day, it's all about your, I say, not your wiring, but your wiring, W-H-Y. What is your why? And so which brings us to the basic premise I also have is we're all gifts wrapped in flesh. Figure out what your gifts are, identify what your gifts are, and you will ideally, hopefully, begin to achieve not only exponential results, but you will feel a lot better about yourself and what you're doing and how you're doing, et cetera. So, so the understanding that you'll go through in part of the five-step process is to make work not work, is to begin to understand the who, the what, the where, the why, the when, the how, and get your questions answered. If you're focusing on that and you spend some time doing that, you will achieve exponential results or feel much more contented in your current state. But the beauty of this, of this is, is that we are all mosaics. You can be you can be working with uh, ten other people, and not none of the other ten have what you have in in the uh, assortment of gifts and talents. You can do something better than ten thousand other people. That has been quantified also through Gallup, based on their research. Everybody in the world does something 
that 10,000 other people cannot do, or they can do better than 10,000 other people, which you know, may not seem like a big deal, but it, the reality of it is it is. So how do we do it? How do we get past this whole vague aspect of, of our, how do we figure this out? The, the, again, getting back to that principle, it's not focusing on what, it's focusing on what's right and not focusing on what's wrong. So part of it is, is beginning to lean in. My basic theory that I like to run with my one-on-one -on -one clients and even teams is it's a, is a four-step process. Name, so I be, ideally begin to identify how am I wired? What, am I, what are my gifts? How do I see my world? So how do I name it? What do I name it? The other part is, how do, all right, what do I claim? How do I claim it? How do I, what, do, what, is, what, do I, what can I take from that assessment or that feedback or that vehicle and say, you know what? That's right. That is me. So how can, I, how can I then now aim it? Aim it in a way that I'm gonna achieve exponential results. The fourth step, which is not reflected in these slides, is all right, you also want to monitor the results. So you wanna track it. So you wanna check it. So name, claim, aim, and check. Those are the four steps. Now, if you can do this, you being the, the uh, rock in the middle of the pond in the middle will have a ripple effect, a positive ripple effect in your family, positive ripple effect on work, your community, and more importantly, the world. So the call to action is going to be in these five steps. It's going to be this. It's like the first thing is, let's identify your wiring. Okay, how are you wired? And literally, you know, we have a number of assessments and, and ways that help you determine that. Now I say assessment, if you plan to take an assessment or you've already taken an assessment, you know, in this, in this case, we're showing an assessment referred to as DISC. It's a fairly popular behavioral assessment. It puts people into quadrants and tells you whether you're primarily a D, an I, an S, or a C. And then you might be a secondary uh, style as well. Put the combinations in and it helps you understand what your wiring is. Now, with that being said, it's important that when you think of assessments, assessments are akin to what I refer to as running with scissors. So here's a disclaimer about assessments. Assessments are dangerous. They, they can be running with scissors because you can get hurt. Why do I say that? Well, 100% of the assessment is not accurate. No, there's no assessment that will be 100% accurate. So that's why it's important to, to take, do an assessment, get some feedback on it and help to help to understand how do I internalize this and what do I do? The other part is, this the assessments do not give you permission to behave badly. Sometimes you'll see in the assessment that it says, you know, when you're under stress, you will behave this way. Or people have, that have this trait have a tendency to be X, Y, or Z, which is perceived by others as negative behavior. Sometimes people read the assessment and say, oh, this is why, this explains why I'm an, I'm an SOB. So I guess I'll just be an SOB. And they proudly wear it like a badge. It doesn't give you permission to behave badly. <laughs> That's another disclaimer. The th and, and the third disclaimer I like to say, it doesn't give you permission to typecast somebody or worse, typecast yourself. An example would be is if you're doing a team assessment and it comes out that one person or there's some people that are much more social and they love, and they love being around people and they, and they seem to be very extroverted. And then all of a sudden they'll read the assessment and people will confirm it, but they'll say, great, you can plan our Christmas, you can plan our parties, right? And, and it's like, well, you know, and somebody might get that feedback. It's like, well, just because it says I am doesn't mean I want to do it. So, so be careful about that as well. The second part, once you, if you pick a vehicle of, of identifying your wiring is also know your wiring. <laughs> and you should know this individual, this is uh, Simon Sinek. And he started with uh, the why. You know, he wrote a book that became a classic. His, if you watched his YouTube, his uh, YouTube video about the the why and getting to why, it's it's had uh, multi million uh, hits on it. And and what he defined in it, what he defined um, is the golden circle. So I've taken the golden circle that he applied and applied it more to less towards companies, but more towards the individual. So what he defined is there's three rings to the circle. And the conventional wisdom, somebody who goes to work and is in a career, they focus on their what? Many times they'll focus on their what? So, so they know what their role is, they know what they do, they know what their product is, they know what service they provide, et cetera. So they focus on the what. 
Then there's others that focus on the how. Some people know how they do it. There are things that make you special, that set you apart from your competition. You have a good idea about what that is. And, and so you, you know, you're, you're focused on that. Simon says, <laughs> no pun intended, is that you, you, your, your sweet spot is gonna be focusing on the why. And what he contends, and I'll uh, apply this to the, the rubric of uh, a professional development and career evolution, is very few people know their why or um, why they do what they do. You know, but the important thing is why is not so much about making money, that's a result. And as Simon would say, why is a purpose and it's a cause or belief. It's the very reason why you exist. So our, our, our opportunity today is to figure out, and for you going ahead, is like, what's my, what's my why? What is, what's really makes me tick? So, so identify how you can help. And, um, and if you, and, and, and the key thing is, and, and I give extra credit to this, um, the first person that knows that can type in chat and identify who this individual is, will achieve something that no one else will achieve. Um, so I'm going to let you stare at this picture and I'm going to give you a hint and Jeff, keep an eye on the chat and then let me know what comes up. Um, now I'll give you another hint. This person was played by, um, Octavia, uh, Spencer in a movie recently, uh, that won an Academy award, not this year, but the previous year called hidden figures. So this yeah, woman, somebody who, uh, identified Henrietta Lacks. Oh, so Close, no, that's Dorothy Vaughn. So Dorothy Vaughn, Dorothy Vaughn, and there, I, there's, there's probably some other ones there. But what she did is, if you, if you ever saw the movie, which is a great movie about the NASA program, before they had the IBM computers and the mainframe set up, they had humans um, uh, that were referred to as computers that literally did the math. And, and, and Dorothy Vaughn, the woman on the left, managed a team of computers and she was a supervisor. But when she saw the writing on the wall and what she did is outside of her normal job, when they started to, in, uh, um, in start to install the IBM mainframe, she took it upon herself to learn about um, the IBM, IBM mainframe and, and how to process mathematical uh, equations and, and basically how to program the mainframe. Because if you saw the movie, they installed the mainframe and no one knew how to program it. Um, so she took it upon herself to learn that. So the moral of the story is, is if you can identify how you can help that's leaning in on your gifts and your talents, even though if it's not in your job description, you will many times be put in a situation where, where you will be presented with opportunities that others that didn't do that um, will. Now, as you saw the movie, she eventually took her team of, of, uh, of computers and they became the actual programmers for NASA's first IBM mainframe. So it's a great story and it literally is a true story, but it's a great uh, moral for us as well. Identify how you can help based on what your wiring is, what you've learned about, what, uh, wh how you see your world, above and beyond your job description. So I love this quote, sooner or later you realize that your real fulfillment comes only from helping others. All of the rest is just temporary. And so you can ask yourself when you're at this point is how can I help when you're trying to figure that out is ask yourself these three key questions. One is what breaks your heart? What really breaks your heart? Next question is what bothers me? That's another way of saying what breaks your heart. You know, so it depends who you're asking, but what bothers you? Then the third thing is where can I add most value? So if you identify a what breaks your heart or what really bothers you, and then you really lean in on what, what you're good at and what your gifts are. And then you can try to figure out a spot and then where you can add the most value. So that, that's one of the things I recommend to people that are trying to find their way. So the fourth part of the five step process is know what you can give. Again, no surprise. If you go through the, the early phase of, of self-awareness to understand what your gifts are, and then also understand what your passions are, and also uh, tie those together so it's connected to your why, it really e begin, uh, becomes a lot easier to uh, figure out what can you give and how can you give it. And, you do, and you, you'll give it away or you'll give it every day because you're eventually 
going to get in, uh, in your own career evolution that your occupation will eventually become a vocation. And if you can focus on not just an occupation, but more importantly, how can I leverage it so it becomes a vocation, um, then you will have a contented life, my friend. And then the other part, the other part which goes into this is how to apply your gifts. Be careful because just because you have a gift or you have you have talents and you've got strengths. If you, if you say, for example, I'm, I'm speaking to um, a, a group some, that might be New England. I know Neil Diamond, you know, seventh inning stretch or, or this, uh, whatever, seventh or sixth, where they play, you know, Sweet Caroline. If you stood right by the speakers at Fenway Park, you might love the song. But if you stood literally right by the speakers and listened to that song, you'd have to hold your ears. And so if you overplay a strength or overmodulate, a favorite song in volume, then what that does is it causes conflict and it causes stress. So the opportunity, as evidenced by that little knob, is you need the art of, of also identifying your gifts and your talents is figuring out how do I modulate this in a way that when it when it's needed, um, I can apply it. I'll give you a real I'll give you a real world example. If you are a team leader. And, and you are, you know that you're very direct, you're very directive, you're, and you've been given feedback that, you know, you're very, you're a high D from a DISC assessment standpoint. Next time you run a team meeting, and I say run in air quotes, you might have an agenda, you might have something, bite your lip, have the agenda, and then start the conversation, and then j just shut the heck up, and just let the group talk, and let the group figure out what you know what the challenge is and how to fix it and then don't say anything you just listen and and that's an example of modulation you know that you want to jump in you know you already have the answer but you want and you it's a lot easier to shortcut by you just saying what the answer is and let let's let's uh, shortcut this meeting but you won't help your team members if you if you just do that so your opportunity to modulate will be is to be quiet listen, ask lots of questions and just and just observe and let the team and let the team come up with an answer. So that's that's an example. And then the fifth part is a Japanese approach referred to as Kaizen. Is that if you've done the first four steps of how you know, of how to maximize your capabilities in the workforce and then you also apply this filter of like what's working, what's not working, what feedback am I receiving? Is it good feedback? Am I, am I receiving consistent feedback that I've heard more than once? Okay, I have an opportunity here. How can I modulate that better? How can I enhance a skill? How can I become more productive? I see the tea leaves coming out, my role's evolving. Now, well, how can I apply my gifts and talents in a way that will help me, kind of like Dorothy Vaughn did with the emergence of technology at NASA? How can I embrace it and then really lean in on it and then, um, and then be ahead of the wave instead of being smothered by the wave. So, so moving forward, those are the five steps, but moving forward, this is what you should expect if, and the key word is if, if you have an open mind, this is what you can expect if you apply this. You can expect a lot of fuzziness. <laughs> you, you're not gonna wake up uh, tomorrow morning and say, I have the answer, I know my why. Or you might know your why, but you're like, all right, well, how do I how do I modulate this? How do I direct it in a way that I'll achieve exponential result? So as a result, you you can expect that you might feel lost, you might feel confused, you might feel unsure, you might feel unclear, perplexed, disoriented, bewildered. That's okay. You should expect that. The other thing is try something, because guess what? If you mess up, you mess up. So you should expect. You should expect if you try something that's outside of your norm that you might make mistakes. And guess what? That's okay. Uh, Google has this great saying is if you wait to perfect, it's too late. So don't wait till perfect. It's too late. Just go do something. Beyond yourself, if you're, if you're involved with others, if you're managing others, if you're a parent to others, if you're married to someone else, try something. Look for someone's strengths instead of their weakness. Compliment them on things that you really respect about them. Um, I've got a 14-year-old son, and, and, I, and I'm very intentional on this. When I see him play baseball, I don't necessarily coach him on what didn't go right. What I give him feedback on is, is just basically let him know, you know, I really love your enthusiasm. 
you know, I really love how you're a great teammate. I love how your coach also recognizes it, that you're such a great teammate and you're virally versatile. So, you know, you're doing a really good job. By the way, let's talk about that thing that happened. <laughs> you can mix it in, but you know, this is what we're trying to get at. But at the end of the day, if you apply the five steps, if you apply the, con uh, the information that we applied in the context and apply it to yourself, you can expect results. You can expect more importantly, success. There's no limits. I mean, there are absolutely no limits to what we can accomplish. A lot of it goes towards mindset. A lot of it goes towards the name, the claim, the aim, and the checking process with the five-step process that I identified as the framework. But remember, more importantly, you are a gift. So if you're sitting down and you're trying to assess where you go, understand you are a gift and you have something to offer. So enjoy the journey uh, because it's, it's a really, it might seem like a long journey, but it's a fast journey. It goes really, really fast. So it's been a pleasure to be with you today. Um, and Jeff and others, uh, I'm gonna pause here momentarily and then see if there's any comments or questions, but thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. This, uh, this is the third or fourth time we've done a webinar together and I have to say this has been your best presentation yet. However, however, I am deducting points for your suggestion that Joe Montana might somehow be better than Tom. <laughs> But uh, folks, go ahead, either in the chat box or the Q&A box, either one, feel free to ask your questions of Mark. And, and Mark, I'll break the ice here. Um, um, as you're talking about, you know, um, knowing your, identifying and knowing your wiring and identifying how you can help and asking those questions about, you know, what bothers you in the world and what problems would you want to fix? I'm curious, you know, when you're doing coaching and working with your clients, how many of those folks are you encouraging to get a new job? I mean, I, I can't, imagine that most folks are sitting in their office thinking, you know, you know, it's really bothering me that my CEO isn't making more money or uh, some of those, you know, can you comment on that for me? Well, it's a, it's a relevant question. And, and at the end of the day, if I'm, if I'm truly coaching, I'm not directing, right? Um, because people generally know the answer. So my role as a coach is to help the eyes see what can't be seen, the ear hear what can't be here, or the mind process what can't be processed. So what I do is I insert questions, insert different opportunities for them to reflect. I might insert an assessment tool. And then our conversations evolve towards them coming up with conclusions um, that they can come up with. I may, I may influence it by saying, well, why do you think you feel that way, right? So it's asking open-ended questions. So, so when somebody who I'm sitting down with is really discontent or not engaged and they really feel a pit in their stomach, then at the end of the day, they have to answer this question. Do they wanna do this every day for the rest of their lives? And if they're truthful with themselves, they know what the answer is and they don't need a Mark Mayette to, to give them that information. Fair enough. Uh, Musa has asked a question that I'm sure you're not surprised to get. He's wondering of all the personality assessments that are out there, Myers-Briggs, DISC, I know that you are a certified strengths finder yep. coach. Yep. Which one do you most recommend? And I realize that maybe that answer changes from person to person. Well, I'm glad that that question came up. And, and um, the way I, I like to answer it is, is just start with a question, which is what are you trying to understand? Because e, there's different assess. It's kind of like a, a tool in your tool in your toolkit. Um, there will be a certain tool, a screwdriver, that will do a job that very well. But if you apply a hammer to it, it won't do the job really well. So if you're trying to assess, in this case, we're talking about gifts. If you're trying to assess what your talents are and your strengths are, there are definite assessments that help you do that. That's why I like Gallup. If you're trying to give people insight in regard to what their wiring is and their behavior styles, then the two most popular ones are gonna be um, DISC or Myers-Briggs. There's also, if you have a dynamic where you're trying to understand and trying to discern, how do I, how do I handle conflict? Because either I'm not handling conflict really well or my team isn't handling conflict really well. There's a different diagnostic that you can test that. If you're, and so, so the, the, the end of the day, the, it goes to is like, what are you trying to discern? Jeff, I will follow up with a link uh, to a blog I wrote in a series of blogs about assessments that might give more context to the answer to that question as well. 
That's great. And I know we had talked offline that you've got a, a bunch of resources that you want to share with folks after this. And, and I'll be sure to send those out in an email along with a link to the recording as soon as we have it available. Um, a very related question from Ellen. <clears throat> Ellen asks, once we identify some of our strengths, what are resources online or, or books that they, she might be able to use to identify jobs that were, are well suited for those strengths? So Ellen's returning to work and would really like some help identifying, you know, pointing her in the right direction based on what she knows about her strengths. Yes, and there are, there are uh, some great online, there's a great online website and, and the name is escaping me now and I apologize because it's, uh, uh, um, but there's a way to actually, you can plug in an assessment result into this in, and what your score was into this website and then it pulls up based on what, your, what the results were, what are some occupations that lend themselves to the results of your assessment. And the assessment is referred to as strong, the strong assessment, um, it's a different assessment. Um, but then it, 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 so if you go to a specific website and enter that in, um, it will tell you which occupations. I will follow up with Jeff with the link to that, to that website um, as well, but I'm off the top of my head, I, I'm losing, that, that I'm having a brain hiccup. <laughs> Um, I, my recollection is that also Myers Briggs and I think it's either Strengths Finder or Disc. I've had the luck uh, to do all of those things. I, they all sort of talk about a little bit about what kind of industries or positions you might find valuable. Yep. But uh, certainly, we'll we'll be sure to be certain to share the link that you've got, Mark. Yes. Um, last chance, folks. We don't seem to have any other questions. Um, but Mark, I'll let you know that Bob wrote in to say thanks for this, reminding uh, some of what's familiar as well as a fresh perspective. And, and Bob really appreciates your enthusiasm for the topic. Um, question here from Taylor. Early on, when you asked those questions, you said those related to filtering the world in a certain way. I'm really curious what you meant by that. Does that have to do with the strength finders or can you say briefly what that refers to? Well, yeah, filtering is, is just, it, it goes even more f back if you back up that, that truck a little bit further. It's all about your wiring, right? Um, and because you're wired a certain way, everyone's wired a certain way, what, that, what I'm trying to infer there is that because of your wiring, you see things differently than everybody else. So, so if you're predisposed to be one way um, and then you nuance that even more, um, everything you see, you see it in a slightly different way than somebody else. Um, and, and that's what I mean by filtering. So when I say filtering, you filter situations, you filter um, conflict, you filter internal turmoil, um, you filter events around you differently than somebody else might. And when you watch somebody that seems to do it, handle something really well, you're like, wow, I'm impressed. That's really, I, I loved how you did that, right? Because I can't do that. <laughs> you might not tell them that, but you might be thinking, wow, that's really impressive. So when I say filtering, basically, how do you take all this stuff in and then how do you process it? But more importantly, how do you aim it? Remember that name, claim and aim? How do you aim it in a way that, that uh, makes you productive in the team dynamic, family dynamic or work dynamic? Mark, thanks again for this great presentation. I, I know I particularly enjoyed your wadded up paper ball analogy, so thank you for that. I'm thinking about uh, testing out my team. I've got an office that uh, has a window that looks right down the hall. I'm thinking about just planting one in the middle and see what happens. See how long, it's, see how long it stays there. It's, it's actually, believe it or not, um, for some hospitality uh, companies like hotels, they will do that during that. They will intentionally put something like that in the lobby and watch to see which applicants pick it up and, and throw it away. That doesn't surprise me at all. Well, Mark, thanks again. Uh, I, I want to thank all of our guests for participating, for your great, great questions and, uh, and thoughts as Mark was doing his presentation. Specifically, want to thank those of you that have donated to BU in the past. Uh, we have a webinar coming up on Tuesday that was originally scheduled for a week ago. Our speaker was not able to, to do that date, but it's on Tuesday. We still have spots. It's everything um, you need to know about networking on LinkedIn. Uh, so I definitely encourage all of you to visit our website to sign up for that or see other alumni events and opportunities that are happening online and in cities around the world. Uh, again, that's bu.edu slash alumni. 
And if you uh, or someone, uh, another BU alum you know would be interested in doing a presentation like this for the BU alumni community, I invite you to contact me at alumni relations or by email at jtmurphy at bu.edu. Uh, thanks again, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mark. Have a great day. And, and everybody have a great day or a great evening, wherever you might be. Thank you, everybody.